everyone. Um, I'm Rod Van Meter from uh, KO University, and I'm going to chair this uh, this morning's session or this afternoon or evenings, wherever you are. Today, we're going to talk about the distributed computing system that was developed at uh, UC Irvine, the project that was led by Professor Dave Farber um, back in the early 1970s. So this is give or take the 50th anniversary. Of course, the project spanned uh, a number of years, and, and so where you would set the anniversary so sort of uh, I suppose you can pick and choose. So Dave Farber was a professor there, there at UC Irvine, and two of the people who worked with him on this were uh, Paul Makapetris and Larry Rowe. Paul, say good morning. Paul, all right, good morning. <laughs> it's a good afternoon for me, but... Uh... Hello, right. everyone. Um, Paul gets to say good afternoon then. And uh, Larry, say hello. Good afternoon. Uh, where's my glass of wine? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, Cherry, can you go on to the next slide? So, this is an outline of how roughly the next hour is going to go. Well, we may let it run a little over an hour. Um, first, uh, Professor Farber is going to do an introduction to the DCS, the Distributed Computing System. And then Paul's going to take over and talk about some of the original goals and how far things actually got with it. And then Larry will follow up with some discussion of the early days uh, prototypes. And then we'll have a panel discussion. Uh, and I'm going to moderate that um, after we have run through uh, so, uh, some questions from the panel session, then we'll open up the floor to questions from people from, who are watching this live uh, via Zoom today. So if you have questions, please prepare those and uh, submit them via the chat. And then uh, either Cherry or I will read the uh, questions out and we'll discuss them via the panel session. So uh, with that, let's get started. Uh, Dave, do you want to okay. uh, say hi to uh, introduce uh, Professor Dave Farber? OK. Uh, Cherry, can I have the next slide? Yeah. Um, let me give a little history of, of, uh, of my time at Irvine and how I got there, because uh, that's part of the dynamics of the situation. I was working at the RAND Corporation uh, after Bell Laboratories, and then I went down to uh, scientific data systems, for those who remember that, actually to build an ADA compile, which we never got around to doing. And during that time, I was teaching in the evening uh, or late afternoon at Irvine, of course. And uh, I was uh, approached by the people down at Irvine, Julian Feldman in particular, to see if I wanted to come to uh, Irvine as faculty member. And uh, they, I decided that yes, that would be an interesting idea. So I went down to UC Irvine, which was just beginning basically the uh, for those of you who know Southern California, the freeway was not yet built down to Irvine and Irvine was surrounded by actually orange trees. So it, was, it certainly has changed. I went down as an acting associate professor, which was interesting in and of itself because that gives you two years to get tenure, which is uh, <clears throat> interesting. When I got to Irvine, one of the first things I was interested in is seeing if I could start a research project. Uh, the, I had conversations with a number of people in Irvine, in particular, Rusty Barbaro, who was a faculty member down there, uh, was a very dynamic echo and, and contributor. Um, and so I guess the, the evolution or the, genesis of, of DCS came from some experience with uh, fault-tolerant computing systems it, that I had at Bell Laboratories where, where we were designing the first electronic telephone system. And it had to be ultra reliable for a telephone system. So anyway, after a, a, uh, a period of time, I wrote a proposal to the NSF to uh, develop a, a high availability fault tolerant computing system. Uh, a lot of the credit for, I think, for the activity should go to uh, one of the program managers down there who was incredibly supportive, John Lehman, who uh, throughout this whole 
period of the DCS project was a very supportive and, and helpful uh, program manager. And we worked together uh, with the ideas and generated a proposal to the, to the NSF. Uh, I should comment just anecdotally here that since I was a acting associate professor, uh, I couldn't be a PI, I couldn't be the formal PI on the project because of the University of California rules. So Julian Feldman volunteered to be the uh, the of record PI for the university. So it was submitted in the name, my name and Paul and uh, Julian's name. Uh, one of the things I re remember, I'm not going to speak to the details of DCS because the Paul and Larry will do that, but uh, observing that things were very, why don't we go to the next slide? Uh, one back. Oh, that's that's the right one. Looking back in, the, in 1969 or so, a little bit of history of, of Irvine, which was started in 1959 when a whole pile of land down there was contributed by the Irvine Company to the University of California if they build a university down there. And in 66, uh, the first UCI graduates came out and we had a computer science department established in 1968. Uh, the technology at that time was the beginning of the mini computers. Uh, you had uh, DEC had a mini computer, other companies had mini computers. They were all reasonably not reasonably powerful, but not very reliable. Uh, we'll the one we chose was actually designed by uh, Lockheed, uh, strange manufacturer of computing equipment to sell memory. And it was not the world's most reliable system. But what we wanted to do was to build a system that could use these mini computers and put them together into a fault tolerant, uh, expandable uh, computing system with some hazy features of doing reliability and doing distrib distribution. When we looked at the literature prior to submitting proposal, there were essentially no systems that filled that, that bill. Uh, there were uh, a couple of paper systems, but they never got built. And one of the uh, one of my particular desires was to actually build one, to actually get not just paper, but to see if we could actually pull it off. Uh, there was. Uh, Network architecture, we had, you know, the, the, the ARPANET was just starting basically. Uh, the IMPs were with uh, connecting the initial ARPANET together. There were some local networks, uh, Newell Farmer and John Pierce at Bell Labs had a, a, uh, a form of, of, of network, uh, ring networks, but they were centrally managed, both of them. Uh, operating system, pardon me, operating systems. Uh, Multics was, as said here, was the cutting edge. And there was some experiments in virtual machines, but it, it was really the beginning of the, uh, of the exponential curve of computing equipment. Uh, next. Sherry. That's a, this is a rough timeline of DCS. I, I won't go through all of it because I'd rather give the time to Paul and Larry, but um, we submitted a proposal in 1970 uh, and we got funding in 71. Uh, one of the largest, largest proposals that the computer science directorate had given, it was uh, I should stay here, essentially $500,000, but when you convert that to current money, about a three, three and a half million dollar project, it's a fair amount. Uh, I'm gonna leave the rest of this to, uh, to Paul and Larry to talk about. They were graduate students at this point and uh, the, the environment at Irvine was interesting to put mildly. We had a bunch of very good graduate students 
contributing to it. And uh, these two were the leading two of those. So with that, I'm going to stop for a while and uh, turn it over to uh, Paul. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, uh, I should I should see one thing. Uh, this uh, picture was published in Business Week, and it, it's a remarkably good uh, uh, cartoon, although I think I had more hair at that point. Um, but it did show the type of, of structure that we were after, where we had a, a whole bunch of computers connected together with capability of running processes on uh, various computers in a very dynamic fashion, uh, something that looks remarkably like a cloud. Paul? Sure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, I was not there at the creation. I came along when the project was uh, underway. The project's goals were documented in uh, technical report four. Again, UC Irvine was pretty much at the start. Um, and the goals explicitly were high reliability, a variety of language systems, uh, incremental expansion, competitive costs, human factors respect, and I wasn't quite sure what that was, but it was there, um, and modest system programming. And I think if I was going to do a research project today in cloud computing, I might translate them a little bit over onto the side. Uh, but, you know, pretty much the same goals uh, permeate the kinds of things we worry about today. Uh, we didn't have microservices. Um, back at UC Irvine, but a lot of the issues are pretty much the same. I think the, the human factors respect have perhaps gone into the surveillance economy, or how do you have privacy, or how do you control the sharing of data in a cloud? Um, but these issues are still with us today. Uh, next. So again, it was loose coupling uh, between the different machines uh, specialized, the idea was that you could get per better performance by having specialized mini processors, um, special purpose machines for file service. Uh, and the, one of the things that was kind of unique was that messages were passed around the ring uh, with 16 bit unique IDs that were structured so that one component was the machine name that uh, machine digit, if you will, uh, which created the process, but that that could uh, that was just to guarantee uniqueness, but that name could be moved by reconfiguring the machines. The machines all had a table of the what processes were local to it, so they would take that message off the machine. Um, there's a bunch of details about the ring network. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, it, it's kind of interesting how analog all of the uh, PDFs are from this era. Um, and uh, this was sort of the original dream. Um, it doesn't really show that each uh, of these machines were going to be connected via a little package that sat on the ring and that pretty much autonomously controlled access to the communications medium. Um, there was some goal about having both short and long messages. Um, and there was also the idea that a smart network interface could uh, create fail-safe data paths or turn off a runaway machine or things of that nature. Um, so that was the starting goal. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Can we skip one there? Yeah. So this is from the 1978, which is sort of pretty much um, the uh, last time that the system had something added to it. So the reality here was that the only ring interfaces that were built were built for the lock three Lockheed Sioux. And the Lockheed Sioux were um, 
the machines where actually all of the programming and so forth uh, took place. Now you might say, well, you know, what are those 620s doing? Well, the 620s were inherited um, and in common with uh, some earlier experience I had at MIT at the architecture machine group, disk drives were so expensive that it was um, the best way for the project to manage its finances, as I understand the story, um, to basically take a 620 with a disk drive and make it have a proxy connection to the SU and have it be that file machine. Um, the proxy being easier to set up, I guess, than to custom build a different ring interface. Um, so basically the real guts of the system were those three SUs. Uh, and the 620s were just proxies to expensive disk drives. Um, you know, and uh, this system actually worked. Um, you could sit there and run a text editor on one machine and a compiler on another machine. And in fact, running your process on SU number three was good because it didn't have any of those peripherals bothering it. So if you had something that was compute bound, that was a good place to run it, as opposed to one of these other machines that might be busy servicing IO requests for other users. Uh, I guess next, please. So if we take a look at, well, did we achieve the goals? Um, there was some uh, reliability issues with the ring interfaces so that if you tried to run a job that was running more than a couple hours, you might run into um, a momentary loss of message. Um, and in some sense, we were pigheaded about this and we wanted the hardware to guarantee reliable delivery of the message rather than adding the software acknowledgement layer. Um, if we were trying to make this production, we probably would have just added that software layer, but it was a research project. Um, the heterogeneous research, I mean, heterogeneous uh, machines and peripherals and languages didn't really happen. All the serious programming really happened on all of the SUs, but we did take advantage of um, file servers, terminal drivers, and all of the IO capabilities of the 620. So in a different sense, you could say, yes, we could have grown this um, cost effective. The, the kernel was really pretty simple. Um, so, you know, I think it's remarkable that how close to the original goals the, the project ended up. Again, I didn't come in at the start of all of this, um, but I sort of came in when it was time to try and make it uh, demonstrably um, capable of combi compiling and rebuilding its own system. That was one of my goal posts and it met that goal. Um, I never thought anybody had a real operating system until they could compile the operating system on that system and build it. Next. Um, we're gonna move on to Larry's discussion oh, yeah. of early prototypes. Larry, oh, take it away. Excuse me, Paul, but before we do that, uh, Cherry, can you go back two slides or three slides? to, yeah, here are 50 sites of hindsight. Paul, do, you didn't speak to these. Did you want to kind of comment on this? I'm sorry, I guess it flipped by. Yeah, I think we got this slide um, up. You know, one of the things was, yeah. Um, one of the things was that we spent an awful lot of time talking about exactly how a ring interface should be built uh, and so forth. And at the end of the day, we certainly did influence what went on at IBM and Proteon. Um, but I really think that to some extent we missed the forest for the trees. Um, the, uh, at the T1 speeds of the day, bits were hundreds of feet long. So all of these discussions about, well, gee, could you fit a whole message in flight out there were <laughs> not happening. Um, and the node packages were getting pretty complex. If we were designing a product to be sold, um, we probably might well have wanted to try and get the cost down and simplify things. I think the biggest 
my biggest uh, regret was uh, Dave introduced me and a couple of other people to uh, the uh, Caltech uh, LSI people, Carver Mead et al. And uh, we sort of had the start of the Moore's Law curve pointed out to us, but we didn't take advantage of it in what we did. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, but, uh, you know, if I could, if I could send a time travel message back to myself, uh, it would be mostly in this regard about saying that the real brass ring here might have been to either think about how to simplify the design to make it commercial um, or how to take advantage of the Moore's Law curve that was about to come upon us and figure out how to do something really cool, but in one package. Um, there's lots of other stories, but we can save those for later. Um, by the way, the lawyers told us that this wasn't an interesting project when the UCI patent lawyers came by because they said, well, nobody would want a, a network that could only run locally. I mean, it would have to be able to run across the country. So there was uh, no patent uh, uh, potential here. Um, that's it for me. All right, let's move on to Larry then. That's fabulous. Um, so when Dave asked me to do this and we had a couple of meetings to discuss it, I was trying to figure out what to talk about. And, and part of the problem is I didn't remember, I didn't, I didn't remember very many details at all about what we did. Um, it's been 50 years. And as we all know, doing history with your mind and memory is, is, is real challenging. But I did go back and start to think about after reading rereading the papers, why did we do this? And this is maybe too many words, but basically mainframes were omnipresent. And in 1970, uh, IBM 370 cost roughly 4.6 million, ran at 12.5 megahertz, which is about $368,000 per megahertz. Mini computers, in 65, you had the 8-bit mini computers, and in 77, you got the DEC VAX, which is a 32-bit mini computer, which basically was, was a, a next generation uh, mainframe from the mid-60s. Mid um, and then the microcomputers came in even after that. So in 1970, it was, Dave was right, that the, the, the view that lots of small computers could replace a big expensive computer was, was pretty well I think it was established. I had the impression that people, a lot of people were talking about this, but the problem was no one had built anything like it. Uh, this is before PARC and, and Ethernet had started. I think they started in 1969 on their, their project. And we met Bob Metcalf up at, at uh, Great Bear Lake in, uh, Dave, I don't know if I remember, is it 72, 73, something like that. He was on his way from Harvard to, uh, to PARC. But basically, the idea is that smaller is cheaper and over time becomes faster because, as Paul points out, the chip technology was improving. So in 1970, the principle was would be with 38 PDP-8s, you could sort of have an IBM 370 at roughly less than 20% of the cost. Now, that's, that's really squinting because, of course, you wouldn't have the memory. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily have the time to complete the run. Um, it, in a smaller machine that wasn't as fast, and there was no software there to, to really do it. But just that was in the air, as in my recollection uh, at the time. So next slide. And at the same time, parallel computing had come on, come on the scene. In fact, the earliest uh, multiple instruction, multiple data products were the Burroughs D825 in 62 and Multix in 69. Uh, but the one that, that I remember uh, just because it had such a big impact, uh, at least in principle, was the uh, ILIAC-4, which was actually a single instruction, multiple data machine in 72. But these things were custom designed, hardware and software with complicated programming models and expensive, very expensive because they were prototypes and, and they were all custom built, including the, the basic hardware. On the other hand, even in those days, in the early 70s, I think a lot of people were talking about parallel computing would someday uh, supplant uh, single CPU computers, but nobody knew how to do it. 
So DCS came in in 1970 with this approach that Dave Dave came to the to the to the main to the uh, discussion and basically said, let's use a land. Now I don't even think the word land was in use at that time uh, to connect off the shelf mini computers, and then we can just do some software to manage the software and give the programming model as being what it would have been if you'd been on a large machine. It's a little bit different than what Park did where they were thinking about your personal computer that you completely controlled, uh, but it's in the same ballpark of what, what was happening uh, in those areas. So next slide. So the networking context uh, was at the time, the biggest, the biggest thing in networking uh, was the ARPANET but frankly, before that, the most important commercial activity was what Timeshare did about, by allowing people to connect terminals from anywhere in the world to their mainframe computer in wherever the, the corporate headquarters was. So that was, those were the two things happening there. But when you think back about what were the unknowns to us in the late 60s, it was the following things. Uh, there was not a lot of discussion about network computer and computer interactions other than what was happening with the, with the uh, ARPANET. And frankly, Bob Metcalf made a big deal about the fact that the IMP interaction with the host was, it, it, everybody looked at, at the network as, a, as though it were like a peripheral. And so you could talk to it like you talk to a disk and the computer was in charge. But he said, in fact, that it was the imp that really was kind of in a co-equal relationship with the, with the host, because there were times that the, the messages coming in would have to say something to the computer and direct the computer as to what to do, which, which doesn't happen in quite the same way with, uh, uh, with uh, file systems. Uh, also, you know, how do you interconnect network? That didn't happen for another four or five years. Uh, when Park started to get much big, bigger networks of, of Ethernet and had to connect them together. And, and also they were trying to connect uh, people in, in DARPA back up to MIT. The notion of protocol design and principles and having a protocol stack and all that sort of stuff, that wasn't, that wasn't yet there. I mean, it was just get the, get the ARPANET working and send messages. But in fact, there was no notion of layering things uh, on top of other things. And there wasn't a lot of discussion, or there, I guess there were discussions, but no well-developed OS primitives and inter-process communication services. And I even remember uh, there was some discussion as to whether a message passing operating system could possibly be as efficient and, and work well enough compared to a conventional operating system. And of course, over the next 10, 15 years, uh, it became clear uh, that you really could do either one, just like in the, in the network world, What's on the bottom layer? Is it, a, is it a circuit or is it a datagram? And the ARPANET was built with a datagram, but everybody knows today that you could do it either way. And then of course, what's the human computer interface, and interface like? Well, in those days, there was only one. It was called the command line. <laughs> and you had some sort of a shell. Okay, next slide. So um, I was at Irvine as an undergraduate from 66 to 70. And I was actually there when Dave uh, first came in the early, I, I think we met before you, um, I don't know, we can check. I don't remember exactly when he went to Irvine, but I think I met him before, before I left. Uh, but I came back in 72 as a graduate student and went to work for Dave uh, and was joining the other people that were on the team at the time, Ken Larson, uh, Don Loomis and, and uh, Frank Heinrich and, and the next thing up was let's build some software. Don was responsible for de designing and building the network interface. And over the years, there was a cast of many that built uh, a, a software, an operating system and actually got things working. I think a lot of the, the most success was had by uh, Paul. Um, but the principles, at least when we were thinking about it, and I think Paul mentioned the, some, of the, some of these as well, is that the node uh, the computer would be a conventional multi-programmed computer. Uh, different nodes might be different hardware, and there was even the notion of, of connecting special service processors directly to the network. Uh, all communication between processes was done via messages, and it was all name-based addressing, which is to say that um, just because you knew the name, 
you did not know where the process was currently running. Uh, it only showed, as Paul said, where it was initially created. And we even spent time talking about what the protocol would be to move a process from one place to the next and coordinate the restruct, you know, resetting the, the, uh, uh, the, the name address or the name machine bound uh, information in the, in the table in the uh, network interface. And then of course, there were some well-known addresses for critical services like files. File systems were just, was just another process you sent, you sent messages to. There was a very small kernel, and then there were a bunch of other processes in the, the, the machine which were there to service the particular needs of that, of that machine. Okay, next slide. Let's, and uh, we've been trying to put together a list of, of who the people were on the project at one time or another, and we've got some of the information, not all. And um, I think over time, we'll actually be putting in some more uh, folks, but that's, that's kind of everything I have. Can I make, um, I'd like to add a few things uh, to sort of wrap up before we get into the question uh, panel discussion. Uh, a couple of interesting, the, the notion of process naming, I think was one of the most important things then at least in principle, you, you could move a process around the system um, to, for instance, the load machine that was beginning to fail. Uh, we did some very limited experiments in that. We realized this was never a huge project uh, by, by uh, conventional standards, even at that time. But, but in fact, we could demonstrate quite nicely the fact that it could recover from failures quite nicely. I remember one uh, time when I think the NSF came down for a, uh, a demonstration of how far we had gotten. And one of the joys of the Lockheed Sioux was they were reasonably flaky machines. It would fail given enough time. And doing the demonstration, in fact, one of them failed. And in fact, everything continued uh, reliably. I think the most important thing there, which just emphasized was things were addressed by name, not by machine. So you can migrate that. The other comment was uh, in, in response to a comment that I think Paul made, uh, reasonably uh, simultaneous with the uh, ring development, was also, uh, Bob Metcalf was developing the Ethernet. And uh, we had long discussions of trying to establish what the real differences were between the Ethernet and the token ring. And in fact, we realized back then that they were remarkably similar, forgetting about the addressing. The process addressing was fairly unique to the Irvine token ring. But in fact, each one was implemented could be implemented in practice as opposed to if you were commercializing it, probably would have switch, which is the way many Ethernets and, and would have, were built. Uh, and we were about to write a joint paper pointing this out when Bob uh, started 3Com. So it was sort of inappropriate uh, to write a paper saying that it's the same. And so we, we just forgot about that very interesting observation. But uh, the, many of the things that DCS uh, started uh, sort of spun off, and I think we'll discover, discuss some of those in the panel. So, uh, Rodney? Yes, thank you. So, um, Jerry, I think you can stop sharing the slides. I don't think we're going to need those. We might, we might ask you to pull one of the figures back up later. Um, so, I have a long list of technical questions. I have a lot of things I'd like to ask you, but the first thing I wanted to do is start a little bit with um, fleshing out some of that context. So Larry already did, already did a very good job of introducing what sort of the common themes in computing were at the time. And Paul talked a little bit about how some of the work from DCS went on to Proteon and, and IBM, but Let's go a little bit bigger picture. Um, Dave, Paul, you're, you're both in the Internet Hall of Fame. Larry uh, spent a couple of decades as, as a uh, well-respected professor at UC Berkeley. What's, 
what has been sort of the broader impact of the work on, on DCS? How did it, did it influence where we are today in terms of our, our uh, overall computing environment? Uh, I'll make a, I'll make some comments. Uh, Larry and Paul, you probably should un, unmute so you can be more sp spontaneous. Okay. Uh, I think one of the one of there were a couple of technical achievements, but one of the uh, I think benchmarks in the DCS effort was that it wasn't just a paper design; it was actually build it and make it work. And uh, that was not a very common thing in, in the computer architecture area. And it was, as I mentioned, the first distributed system I know of that actually functioned as opposed to uh, function on piece of paper. Uh, so th I think that was important. Uh, the notion of, of addressing by name uh, it started showing up in other contexts and, and periodically shows up in the, uh, even now in, in, I would call it content address networking. Now, the direct connection, I have no idea. Uh, but there are a whole set of things. Uh, one could argue that that nice little picture from Business Week looks remarkably like a cloud computing environment. Uh, you know, and I wouldn't say that, that there's direct uh, connection to the DCS project, but DCS sort of put in the notions in the community that these things could, could be done and that you actually could implement it. Larry, you have any comments? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I look at cloud computing and, and it's kind of like take, take the machines out of the machine room and put it in, in uh, uh, some data center run by somebody. Uh, typically Amazon. But the real thing is you buy services and your services tend to get provided by multiple machines. You don't get your services for running your programs and your systems by just using one machine. You're using a bunch of machines. And in fact, the parallelism and, and uh, all of the, the moving function around so that the end-to-end -end performance is really good. Um, it, it's very much, it seems like it, the, the kind of thing that you would see happen if you'd started from the DCS perspective of you have a bunch of little machines and you're going to now try to run things on them and 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 spread things out. Paul, any comments? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, I think uh, as Dave pointed out, actually doing it and having a prototype that, as I said, was good enough to kind of build itself um, and was good enough to be a general purpose programming environment. Um, uh, you know, it, it led me to explain once upon a time to a person, I think the first time I used the phrase, well, it may not work in theory, but it works in practice. Um, you know, that, that uh, you know, an experimental proof is always the most powerful kind that, that you can create. Um, from my point of view, um, you know, that I did in particular the DNS, there was a little bit of sort of reptile DNA from the DCS that went into um, the DNS, which said that, you know, fixed length names probably aren't going to cut it and you need to think about having structure and so forth and so on. Um, you know, the, so from a standpoint of influencing me, that was a big deal. I think. From a standpoint of tech transfer, I wish we had done better. And I often ask my question, ask myself the question, what would have motivated us to do better? Um, I think that if we had had an application or a requirement that we could fulfill in a production world, um, that would have that would have been great. Um, after Dave left, Tim Standish and I submitted a proposal to uh, NSF to work on real-time networking support. In other words, networks that would support real-time applications and so forth, which I think was interesting enough to fund. Um, but I think that something along those lines, um, a real application and some real requirements to meet, 
uh, that that would have pushed the technology out there. Uh, you know, like Steve Jobs says, real artists ship. Um, and we did a work of art, but we didn't manage to ship it to too many other places. Um, I mean, just the operating system and the overall process structure stuff. Uh, let me add one thing to, after I left Irvine, I went to the University of Delaware and we started a project there, uh, supported by IBM actually, uh, called the Series One Distributed System, which basically used many of the ideas from DCS on a uh, three Series One machines connected by a network. I forget the architecture of the network. Uh, and that actually transferred when Dave Sinkowski was the, was the student involved in that. And when he went to Belcor, they actually commercialized some of the ideas in back of the Series One distributed system uh, into hardware that ended up in the telephone industry. Uh, most of that is not documented. The Series One distributed system is uh, sidebar Series One. The Series One machine, IBM Series One, uh, was an interesting machine because it was really a future systems machine. It was a capability based architecture, which we never got around to actually taking advantage of. Well, that would have been a very interesting research project in and of itself. Yeah, there was also an effort, uh, papers in the bibliography uh, that, that was done at uh, NSA, although who knows where that really went. Maybe it's running the world today. <laughs> but some of the ideas, I spent some time down at Cape Canaveral. Uh, I guess that was called Cape Canaveral back then, maybe Cape Kennedy by that time, uh, talking to the shuttle people and telling them the ideas back of DCS. Uh, I have no idea whether, what they gathered from that, but I spent many a happy day in Florida. Uh, when was that day? I was still at, I was, uh, I'm not, it was either when I was still at Irvine or when I, when I got to, to Delaware. I, somehow I think I was in Delaware when I went down there. The reason I ask is, is I gave talks to, uh, when I was at Berkeley, they would, they, you know, introduce the new faculty. And so they'd ask me to give a talk. And I ended up talking about DCS because it was something people were interested in. And um, it's so funny. I gave a talk to this group and it had a couple of guys from the aerospace industry. And they looked at me and they kind of, at the end of the talk, they kind of said, well, why are, why is this such a big deal? It's already been done. We're doing it in our spacecraft. We have five computers and we have a general prop, prop uh, general purpose way of, of putting jobs in different places. What, why is this such a big deal? I wonder if that was uh, the result of some of the discussions that you had with those people in Florida. It may well have been. Uh, this would have been, this would have been in 77, 78 timeframe, 79. Certainly the timing would, might, might have worked out. We also had discussions with uh, Fort Meade, uh, which, um, yeah, no, anyway, onward. Say again, Paul. Well, I was at Draper Labs around that time, and the shuttle people were certainly trying to figure out how to have three related computers talk on a shared bus and have no single points of failure. Mm -hmm. So I take a slightly different look at, uh, at how you measure success. Uh, I, I was thinking about, at the time, there were two other major projects that, gave, that got a lot of attention. And in fact, in, some, in, in one case was pretty famous, obviously. Ethernet and the Altos, the park work, uh, the, the, the most important thing there is they had a huge amount of money and a lot of people, and they spent 10, 15 years working on those systems and deployed them in the labs and developed technologies and made them work because they were actually using them. That's, that's a real key point. That's the one you have to build, as, as um, Jim Gray used to say, demo or die. And, and the second thing is you got to deploy it to people with a problem. And just as Paul said, the, the problem that we thought about using these machines for was to do our stuff, you know, compilations, editing, 
that sort of thing. We weren't thinking too much about how could we sell this to the office because, well, who cares? Um, so that one I would say was a success. There was another project at the time, Herb Baskin at, at uh, Berkeley, and he had ARPA funding for building a better time-sharing system. And to be honest, I don't know the details about it, but Dave and I took a trip up there and went to visit them. And uh, we were sort of shocked because the first thing is that the, the project was not on the campus. It was actually in buildings downtown in Berkeley. And they had 40 people working and had been, had been working on this hardware and software for, at that point, I think two or three years. And they barely had boards to, to, that would do anything. Uh, it turned out to be a massive failure and Randy Katz has pointed out that it was that it polluted uh, uh, ARPA to doing any systems projects at Berkeley for almost 10 years uh, as a result. And so that one, you've pretty clearly a fail. Uh, DCS was funded by NSF. NSF doesn't have the kind of money that ARPA and, and Xerox had to invest in developing these ideas. And even though it may look like a lot of money, $3 million, you know, we were forced to buy these really lousy machines from Lockheed uh, that that barely worked. Um, and and just to be real clear about that, Dave, Dave and Paul know this real well. Uh, we at one point were trying to send messages across to a process on a machine that the records were the relocatable object modules for a process, and we were using the loader on the other side to do relocation loading into the address space of the process. And in the, in the process of, you know, so we'd read the file, break it up into a message, send it out to the other side. The other side would take it, do relocation and put it into, a, into um, memory or rather put it into memory and then do relocation. And lo and behold, all of a sudden the machine halted over there on the other side. Long story short, it, it, was, it took us a while to figure out what really was going on because by the time we found out what was going on, or that the machine halted, everything else was gone. So we just didn't have much of a record of what had happened. Long story short, it turned out that when the messages were being copied around by the DMA, the addresses were not accurately putting the data into the addresses they were supposed to go into. They would put a bunch of things in into the correct location and then they would suddenly put a couple of words in a different location because a bit flipped in the DMA. And then it went back to doing the others. So first off, it was a nasty problem to find. I shudder to think how we would have found it if we weren't loading uh, relocatable object module records, which had a software checksum on each record. And it was the software checksum that the loader on the remote machine saw was failed. It didn't know what to do with it, so it just stopped. And that's how we ran into that thing. And those are that's the nature of the kinds of problems we were running with, basically because we didn't have enough money to buy real hardware that could actually work reliably. And we were struggling to kind of make this stuff, make this stuff work. So, so I think DCS was pretty much a success. Of course, Paul and I have a vested interest in that being so, as does Paul, as does Dave. But as a research project funded by NSF, uh, it was low amount of money. It funded a lot of graduate students for a lot of years. It certainly changed the ethos of, 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 of several computer science departments because of what was being done there. So I, I think it was a moderate success, not as successful as Park, but that's the, it wasn't the business we were in. Let me, let me add one more thing because it's relevant to the environment we're doing this in. Uh, professor Iso from a, uh, I think at that point, an assistant professor at Keio University, uh, asked if he could come over and spend a month with the DCS project. And we, of course, said, yes, please come over. And he spent a month and then went back to uh, Tokyo and built his version of what he found in, at DCS. I don't have very much information on that because all the documentation was Japanese and difficult to, to read. But I would argue that that had a impact because as many of you know, Professor Iso went on to, to form the SFC campus and generate piles of very good students. Uh, and in hey, fact, 
one final thing. The fact that I actually met him and invited him over was the genesis of being able to, for Larry Lamweb and I to come over and put CSNet uh, in the hands of ISO and his students. Dave, do you remember exactly when that was, when ISO Sensei's uh, visit to uh, Irvine was? Oh, God, no, I don't. He was an assistant professor. It was relatively early on in the, in the project, but uh, I really don't remember the, the date. Uh, I'd love to see some of the stuff he did at KO. Uh, I've never read the stuff because, as I said, it was in Japanese. And punching one more thing, one of the big successes of, of the DCS project was a lot of very good graduate students. I was hoping one of you would stand up and say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're it's already ten till. So I suspect we'll run a little past the the uh, the top of the hour because we have so so many things to talk about. But everything that's been covered so far has been really good. Um, I wanted to ask a uh, where a a question here. I'm afraid we're not going to get to everything that's been covered in the chat. Um, but the uh, you've talked Dave Dave and and Larry both talked about the fault tolerant capabilities of the system. And you talked about how processes or tasks in, in, the, in the system could be located on any of the three SUs, right? So were individual tasks or processes, were they replicated? Were they fault tolerant in, 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 uh, in some sense? Or was it the case in you know, the, uh, the definition of, of a distributed system where, where a computer that's not the one you're using goes down, it renders your own unusable, right? So. Um, if you needed a to, to send a message to, to, to another process in, that, that was cited in another computer in order to complete your work and that machine went down, how did you handle that? Dead silence. I think that's the answer. <laughs> I, the one thing I'd say is that as in a lot of research projects, we had a vision of what we were working on and we had a prototype that we're trying to build. And there was a great distance between the vision and the prototype. So Paul, you, you, you were around when, uh, when things actually ran better. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, there were, there, I, I remember one episode there where I, I, I was working mostly in the kernel. And uh, one day I said, you know, you're running the scheduler with interrupts enabled. This way leads to madness. You just can't do this. And I said, well, that's the way we've always done it. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was a very odd trade-off we had because if we use the scheduler that ran with interrupts enabled, every so often things would hang, but uh, the system would run faster, okay? So that you had this kind of, well, do you want it faster? fast or do you want it to just continue running forever? And by fast, we were talking about sort of characters appearing on, you know, the, your terminal, because uh, if a process decided to write on your terminal, that would involve it sending a message from that processor to the IO handler for that, which would then talk across to the 620, um, which would then actually send the character to the physical terminal. Um, and then, you know, if, if it was going the other way, there was a going the character. So, you know, that, <laughs> that was one of the, the interesting aspects to all of this was that things were really pretty slow. Um, from a standpoint of recovering from failures, it was pretty easy. You would just see, oh, okay, um, that process has stopped consuming CPU time. <laughs> it must be hung. Uh, so that was one of the popular uses of, I think we called it SysStat, is that um, we ended up having something that was sort of a tick mark that sort of said, yeah, it's done something in the last second. Um, and, you know, uh, because these, the, these intermittent hangs were kind of the price we paid for some intermittent issues with the, with the system. Um, at any rate, uh, you know, like I said, it, it, it proved that it could work. Uh, it, it, it wasn't necessarily, 
um, production ready. So the uh, one of the question, first questions that was asked in the chat here what was, um, was um, what applications you all had in mind for the system. I think we addressed that already. And Larry said pretty much, and based on what Paul said, you all were very much systems oriented people. And so the, so the focus was on the system itself rather than getting it into the hands of users. Um, is that is that a fair characterization? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, there's another question here in the chat on uh, the relationship between DCS and multicast. So did, did you all think of, of any sort of multicast um, yeah. applications yeah, or systems in this respect? I, and I just wrote something into the chat. Uh, yeah, multicast was, was built into the system and broadcast uh, because you could put the, the an address, and we actually had in the address structure, we had some addresses kind of reserved for, for uh, uh, communicating to the specific machines and also communicating to all machines. Uh, you could put the same address in multiple ring interfaces and, and every one of them would, would match and presumably some would, if not all, would copy, which uh, was part of the, the, uh, the basic, basic design. I, when I was there, we never got to the point of actually doing much with multicast. I don't know, Paul, did you guys do very much with, with multicast at any point? I think Paul is. For the multicast commands that were useful to the IO handlers, if you wanted to find a file, you could broadcast, multicast a message to all IO handlers saying, do you have file X? Or in particular, the way that um, the command process or aka would start up is it would say hi are there any free animals out there oh i'm afraid we're losing you and so it would pull well, turn off your video well there you go you'll, uh, maybe that yeah i did um yeah we were you could send broadcast messages to say send me all the free terminals or dear all io handlers please tell me if you have the following file. Um, so that multicast was actually used in production and so forth and so on. Uh, perhaps you would think in a, in a fairly limited way uh, because it turns out that the hardware in the um, ring interface do not directly accommodate it, uh, which was something we attempted to fix in the design of the next generation uh, ring interface that we called the Lenny. Uh, local network interface that was an ARPA uh, sponsored project. Some of them actually got delivered to Berkeley. Yeah, I, and I know the grants that paid for them. <laughs> so the uh, Paul, I actually, I, I wanted to invoke uh, moderator's privilege here and ask a, a question since my original background is in storage systems and file systems and distributed uh, storage in that sense. What was the interface between processes and the remote disk? So when, when you made a, re a remote uh, query, was it for a, a block number on a disk drive or was it a key value store or, what, or was it a, a, a named file system in what we think of as, as sort of the modern sense? And was there any provision for caching or locking in this system? Uh, no, the, the the primitives were things like, do you have file X? And there was, I believe, a, a device that could be wild carded and a file name. So uh, what what is so you could say, what was X in this context? Was X a uh, a human readable file name, or or was it a lower level identifier? The file the file names were you know. Um, the kind, the kind of short file names that were typical of operating systems of, of the time. Okay. Okay. Go on. There was sort of a path name because you would also talk to terminals and line printers and other stuff as opposed to things that were, that had a real file system on them. But, um, you know, basically it was all done via messages to say, can I reserve a particular resource? And then the IO handler would hand back a, 
a, a logical file I'd number or something. It was called an LFN. I don't remember exactly the expansion of the acronym. And then you would just send that IO uh, handler the LFN and like a read and write request. Um, so, you know, it was just sort of the usual file system commands of the time sent all in uh, messages. Yeah, let me let me uh, insert one which is sort of relevant. Uh, we we explored the 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 architecture for connecting multiple DSSs DCSs together. Uh, we never built it, but we we actually developed a a set of protocols which essentially were source routing protocols. Uh, and in fact. Uh, if we had had the time and the energy to do it, it would have been, it would have worked because, you know, source routing uh, in multiple networks is, is still in use. So first example I, I know of where it was proposed, but again, we did not implement it. Uh, ran out of students more than anything else. And I think I was off to, to Delaware at that point. Let's see. There's another comment in the uh, um, chat here about uh, bidding for for uh, resources. So the uh, the image that you that was in that um, Business Week article showed individual processors bidding for. I'm willing to do this job for two dollars. I'm willing to do that integration. I'm willing to hold your data for for, for you. Um, did any of that bidding architecture actually get uh, implemented and, and put into place, or, or was that part of the longer term vision still? Um, I think there was a little bit of that got done because if I the, the dream was that processes would be composed of a pure a separable pure and impure segment. So that, for example, if what you were trying to do, and once upon a time the object of DCS was to run basic. I, I read that in a report. Um, but at any rate. What you could think about doing is to have a pure process that would be, say, your text editor uh, and an impure uh, segment, which would be the data being edited, the, the memory image of that. And so there was some idea that what you could do is you could share the pure stuff between multiple users and so dedicate one machine to editing, say, so it would have one copy of the editor code and multiple files that people were editing. Um, and then there was some idea about when you actually said, please create me a process that you would try and send that to the CPU that was um, less loaded. And I think some experiments and some prototypes were done in this area, but I'm not sure that it ever got to what I would call product quality. Yeah, we, we did uh, some, some uh use of it, you, if you were looking for space, okay, you wanted to establish a process someplace, not sure where, uh, you'd send about uh, out the equivalent of requests for proposals to, to host that. And you put some metrics in there on, for instance, how much memory you had left or how much time you had left. And they'd be sent back to the, to the process that asked for the space. And it would make a judgment on who who to award the the privilege of running that process. I believe that was implemented, if my memory serves me correctly. So in principle, the 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 bidding uh, notion was there because the response in the simple case was I bid you know fifty k of memory and I run uh, at this load level, and the, the requester could look at those and decide which one was the appropriate one. To, to say, okay, you have it, and then send a message telling it to establish this process from the file system and execute it. I believe that was running. Um, so two things on the um, distributed uh, processes. Let's see, my, my notes from an earlier meeting say, say that, that the process migration stuff actually got implemented as a prototype far enough to get into to sort of proof of concept, but, but wasn't sort of in, in regular use. Is that, is that right? Are my, are my recollections of that right? Uh, my memory is that we, we knew how to do it. Uh, I, 
don't know whether we actually did it in, in a full sense. Uh, we could certainly, re if, if things went off, we could, we could migrate uh, code, uh, you know, executable code. I don't think we were very well set up to migrate the data that went with it, uh, except through the file system. But uh, that was the goal. And, and I think we, we started down that path. I really forgot how far we got on that. Uh, you know, it was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, it was certainly the intent to do it. One minor clarification. So, so uh, all of the, the inter-process communication was all done via messages, right? There was no right. shared memory. Um, and the, the Rodney, Rodney, think of the stupidest little eight bit computer that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> I'm a little younger than you guys, but I, but I remember, uh, the, the smaller microprocessor systems. Yeah. So the, uh, those process IDs and, uh, so any, any inter-process communication involved a, uh, a message. So what happened if, if the process you were trying to address actually existed on the same node you were on? Did that, all, did that actually result in a message that, that went through part or all of the inter-node messaging stack? Or, or did the system sort of recognize that, that, that the location was local and do, and do something more, more efficient and direct? That's a uh, it would get hairpinned. Yeah. Uh, because you had, you had a table of who the processes were and I believe the way that you, in general, um, did did multicast messages was by setting the uh, origin machine address to zero, um, and so that would it would know if it was a potential multicast or not. So if it was a multicast address message, it would go out on the ring. But if it was a specific process address, and you had that specific process you would hairpin it, no reason to send it. Okay. Um, let me ask one more real, real quick technical question and then I think we should probably wind up. Um, when the messages were received, so, so the, the, uh, the ring interface I gather held a table of identifiers of processes that it could then use to detect whether or not this message was for a process that was hosted on, on this particular machine at this point in time, right? How did that, how was that actually implemented? How did the ring interface get this list of, of processes, process IDs that, that it's ho hosted for? And what were the limitations in, in that? Was that implemented in directly in hardware or in firmware in the ring interface? I think the ring interface was a little simpler than having what we would call firmware in a modern sense. Yeah, I, it, my recollection of this, um, and this was before I got into speaking hardware, um, was that there was a table of some finite size, like 16, and the uh, entries, and that those were set by software. Um, and then the hardware would match the message that was coming by. And there were two bits on the end of the message called match and accept. Uh, match would be, the, the receiving or as the message went by, if you recognize the address, you were, you were commanded to turn the match bit on if you recognize the address. If you re recognize the address and could copy the message, uh, you were supposed to set the accept bit. So the match bit, if it came back match without accept, you would say, well, somebody wanted it, but they didn't get it, okay? And if it came back with just accept, uh, then you would know that the message went through and that was that was goodness. Uh, the problem would be if you got a bit error in one of those bits, you could potentially have um, a message that wasn't delivered that you thought was delivered. Uh, the other thing that could happen that was kind of uh, interesting is if uh, you were sending this to a multicast address, you didn't necessarily know uh, you know what the the, the fine grain result was, unless you got an, an an a complete except with no matches, uh, um, in which case you would know that everybody got it. But if it was match and accept, you know somebody got it and somebody didn't, but you didn't know which. 
And if you continued to get that result, you didn't know whether or not somebody was confused or whatever. Um, at any rate, I think the, the details of this, um, I had a debate at one point in time with Bob Metcalf and we're up on a stage and Bob Metcalf was saying, hey, ethernet is good because it's on passive coax that you can branch and do multi-way. And I was saying, oh gee, you know, the ring is great because you can send it over cheap twisted pair. Now, the thing that's amusing to me is that Ethernet has, a, has evolved to be a point-to-point -point protocol. Um, and in the course of its evaluation, it went to point-to-point -point twisted pair. And now most of it is over the Ether <laughs> as was originally designed. Um, you know, and there, there are some parts of it, which is sort of the idea of the frame format um, and the idea that it's only probabilistic and so forth, uh, that are really great. And people build ethernet switching systems these days where basically you can relocate the, the map. Everything was great until about 10 seconds ago there. Um, the DCS there. with the design. All right, we lost uh, the, the, your final comment there, but I think I think we got mo most of that. Um, it's already eleven after, so the uh, I think it's probably time to move into sort of a final phase of this. There's some really good comments that, that are in the chat here, and I hope we'll, we'll uh, capture those and and uh, store them along with the, the archival ver version of this. Um, so thank you all for the for the comments, and I'm sorry we didn't get to everything in this. Um, let me ask, I think we lose Larry in uh, ju just a few minutes, uh, but, but the, uh, let me ask Larry to, to, uh, to sort of uh, make a few final comments here and then Paul to make uh, a few final comments and then we'll let uh, Dave wrap things up. How about that? Um, well, it was a great project. I mean, I love to build things and uh, it was a great idea. Um, it seemed like, like the right thing to do at the time. It was research and I had a great time doing it. And I am forever thankful to Dave for that. And so this has been fun. <laughs> Paul? Yeah, I think I, I think I would echo that. I think that, uh, you know, one of the things I've always wondered about is why agencies like ARPA and NSF don't seem to do more introspection to try and figure out what are the common elements of things that go right. And I think that this project was probably one of the examples of th where a lot of things come to go right. And uh, I'll let Dave speculate on what the uh, forcing Actually, thing issues were. Paul, Paul, I think I have I have an insight on that, which is uh, NSF is worried about educating the next generation of students. And so, if they put a dollar into hardware, it's a dollar that's not being spent on students. And so the focus is, and, and I know this because I did NSF grants for years, and it was always a struggle to get some, some money to do anything with hardware. And, and so uh, I think that's just the reality of the funding source. It just didn't have enough money to put into this to, 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 to really push the project further than, than was likely to be pushed with the resources available. I tell you, I wish we had that problem over here. I think we have the opposite problem. I find it easier to put uh, put grant money into hardware than into students, and I would rather put it in the students. Anyway, um, uh, uh, as the former ARPA program manager, I'll, I'll just tell you that the styles of the agencies are different, and they also vary with time, and that may be a good thing. All right, um, Dave, let me turn back over to you for, for to uh, to uh, wrap things up. Yeah, just repeating, uh, I think DCS educated a lot of very good students who went on to do things that helped the field. Uh, the ideas back at DCS sort of were uh, polluted or, or spread to a lot of places. Uh, you know, uh, some of the ideas generated very good follow-on ideas. Some of the ideas appeared in interesting machines and interesting software. Uh, I always looked at uh, NSF, especially NSF projects as uh, idea student generators and idea generators. 
The other thing is, that remember, this was before the days when if you had a research project, you looked to the possibility of establishing a company, right? That just was not particularly what I was interested in doing. And, and uh, so there wasn't that forcing function of how can we commercialize this rapidly? The idea was to do research and to be open about it. And so we welcomed visitors. We, we, <clears throat> we talked as much as we could about it and published as much as we could about it. And I think that's, uh, that's been changing over time, uh, unfortunately. But uh, you know, I think we have two examples here of, of students that came out of this and have done marvelous things in the field. That's the reward, one of the big rewards, as well as interesting ideas. Yeah, I guess in that sense, so, so uh, Paul, uh, I met Paul first in 1986, and he's been a big influence on me. So, so that's uh, two generations down the, the, at this point. So hopefully we'll all pass it on. Um, so this has been our session on the history of the uh, distributed computing system that was run by Professor Dave Farber at the UC Irvine uh, in the uh, early 1970s through, through the mid to late 1970s. Um, thanks to uh, Dave and to uh, Larry Rowe and to Paul Makapetris. Thank you all for all, all the amazing work that you did on, on, both on this project and in the, uh, the decades since. And thanks for, for uh, continuing to be part of everything here. And thank you all to everyone who showed up for, for the uh, session. And we'll put this, uh, the video on this uh, up and we'll make sure that as much of this information as we have collected as we possibly can, we'll get archived for the long term so, so that 50 years when people are looking back at the 100th anniversary of DCS, the information will all be there. Thank you all. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.